My name is Cameron Crow. I'm one of the founders of Panga. I'll be your host and moderator today, and I'm joined by Panga co-founder Barbara Tien. Thank you all for coming, and welcome to Roots Tech and our session, Panga hosts Story Center's Robert Kershaw. Before we get started, some housekeeping. The session will be recorded and available to you after the session. All attendees will be on mute. Communication controls are located at the bottom panel of your screen. Please put your questions into the Q&A or the chat, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. We'll also occasionally add content and resource tips for you in the chat window uh, that you can follow along at your own, uh, in your own desire. Before I introduce the speaker, I know many of you are new to Ponga, so first I'd like to give you a little background. We need to better understand family history now more than ever. Between the pandemic, losing loved ones, the increasing distance between families, generations, and the demands of everyday life, we need to refocus on discovering and sharing those histories that define who we are and where we come from. Ponga is a digital storytelling service that was born out of the realization that we're perhaps a generation or two from losing awareness and appreciation for the stories and legacies that shaped us, our values, and who we are as individuals. The service is made up of several elements to support this goal. First, it's an online service that enables you to um, your efforts across three domains. One, quickly and easily arrange your photos using our unique facial organization technology. Second, to curate and tell the stories within those photos, either in written or verbal form, adding any number of resources to the photos like maps, locations, and multimedia. And third, to put those photos back into circulation to share and collaborate with friends and family so they can enjoy the content or crowdsource stories from others, all in a completely secure and private way. We also su uh, provide support for your efforts, onboarding services like one-on-ones and group events, user support if you get stuck or have a question, and a rich library of FAQs and blogs to help answer common questions. Uh, this speaks to the thriving community that's developing around Ponga, including subject matter experts, webinars, and content like you're getting today. It includes how-to, success stories, unique use cases. And we also offer master classes and jumpstart programs. We developed Ponga to capture these important moments and stories, and we wanted to take the worry out of organizing photos and storytelling to make it fun, quick, and easy. Let us take on the heavy lifting of organizing so you can get to the joyful part. Simply, we help you bring your photos to life through the stories locked within them. Okay, that ends the commercial. We're not <laughs> going to subject you to any demo of Ponga today, but please go to ponga.com slash learn hyphen more for a video demo on how it works and how it can simplify your storytelling and photo organization efforts. In addition, you can go to the site and sign up for a one-on-one -on -one session and watch for emails for a future demo. Okay, today we're gonna to explore how digital platforms like Ponga can be used to capture the stories of families and engage a new generation in the experiences of their ancestors. We'll discuss combining stories and photos within the internet to, captivate, to create captivating digital stories that will last. So today, I'd like to introduce you to Rob Kershaw, who's the Director of Public Workshops for StoryCenter.org. StoryCenter's mission is to create spaces for listening and sharing stories and build a just and healthy world. Their public and custom workshops provide individuals and organizations with skills and tools that support self-expression, creative practice, and community building. Since 1993, they've helped over 20,000 individuals share their stories. Rob is a photographer, designer, and writer who's been working on story and photography projects with remote communities in Canada's Northwest Territories since 2001. He's the author, co-editor, and designer of four books about history and ecology of various areas in Northern Canada. And before joining Story Center in 2007, he spent time publishing a small town newspaper and working on an oil rig. He has a BS in ecology and communications at the University of Calgary, and we're fortunate to have him here today to share his experiences, best practices, tips and tricks to support and accelerate your storytelling efforts. As a founder of a digital storytelling movement, he believes strongly in the power of story. Rob, welcome. Well, uh, thank you, Cameron. Um, yeah, I guess I, but somewhere back there, I did graduate from university <laughs> a long time ago, but thank you for that uh, gracious introduction and welcome everybody. And thank you for having me on a, on a Ponga platform. I'm super excited. Absolutely. Well, why don't we kick off and give everybody a little bit of background on Story Center? I mean, mm -hmm. it's a very interesting mission and mandate. Tell us a little bit about how it all came about. 
Well, it actually came about through someone that was a photographer and a videographer and the archivist of a family that took a lot of home movies. Dana Ashley was a traveling sort of performance artist. He was known as the spaceman near the van and he would go around to festivals, uh, art festivals and theater shows and folk festivals, all sorts of things. And wh what he had done, he created these 60 little vignettes of photographs from his family's past, a lot of home movies that his father would shoot and I think his grandfather also. So they were like super eight and super eight old films. And he had made these little short little pieces and then he would go on stage with a TV with a fire log burning, sitting on a log and as if using a campground and tell stories. And it would, they were about his road trip. It was called Next Exit. The idea that as we travel, we see a sign and say, ooh, what's down there? And off he would go. He also would take photographs on the road. So he had this huge archive of family photos, videos, plus the ones he was taking as he was traveling as a young man and a young performing artist. He actually sold his archive to America's Funniest Videos. Oh my that gosh. That show back in the day and sort of got sucked into the, to the, to the vortex of television and media and kind of separated himself from his own archive. Um, but what he got to do was sit inside the, uh, the big machinery back when you couldn't make videos and there wasn't anything like Photoshop or really any per personal computers and start crafting these short little films about his, his travels and his family's life. And so he somehow extracted himself out of that, um, that hole of, uh, of big corporate media making and then now had a new show that he would do this, these little vignettes. And he would speak to them and behind them would be a slideshow. And people said they recognized those kind of stories about the family history, but they were also curious, like, how did you do that? Because this is before anything, um, like we're on Zoom here, we're on a virtual space, none of that existed. And so they were very curious about his own journey and the production of it. And so he teamed up with my boss and my executive director, Joe Lambert, because Joe Lambert was running a theater practice in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And he had a show called Life um, Solo Mio. So the stories of monologues. So Spalding Gray, Whoopi Goldberg would grace the stage. And Dana Ashley was in that, that company. So he would sit on stage telling these stories of the road and of his family and had these little videos behind him. And Joe, they saw the future, uh, sort of the dot-com first era, and said they shut down the theater practice and opened up a little digital clubhouse in the mission of San Francisco, helping people work with their own photographs, tell stories about important things in their life. So it actually was born out of sort of community theater practice. And it's we've been doing the workshop ever since. And it's, we just, yeah. just um, celebrated our 30th anniversary. I haven't been around that long, but the, the Story Center has been around for 30 years now. That's fantastic. It's, I mean, it just sounds like that early experience was almost like a video-based Jack Kerouac kind of. A... He was he was a bit of that kind of a character. I mean, yeah. he had a persona, he had a little outfit, and he would show up uh, and do these little performances and little screenings and little storytelling, you know, but on the big stage at uh, Life on the Water, uh, the solo mio performance was was the grand place where he could really shine and show these these videos that he created um at midnight in the you know in whatever theater i mean whatever media company he was under contract with wow. at the time. so it sounds i mean it's interesting kind of moving in you know away from just the written word to video imagery media mm. and and how you then went to panel-based discussions use people you know to tell small anecdotes maybe can you talk about how that kind of manifests itself and what you guys mean by digital storytelling and and why you think it's important well we used to be we can go to the slides but i think the conversation right now is rich uh, we used to be known as the center for digital storytelling so this digital storytelling was seen as new uh, seen as a movement this idea of digital media making and the the blending of digital and storytelling um, was ripe for the time. We have since branded a story center because we wanted to focus on story. But what we realized was people would be coming to our workshops, including my very first experience. I brought a photograph, a photograph of myself um, with me leaning up against my very first car that I ever bought with the first paycheck I made of the job out of college. Uh, that photograph, as I've told you, Cameron, in the past was a bit of a joke with my family because the person leaning up against the car was 21 or 22. 
made their first paycheck and got a bunch of money and bought a car and right. thought they were very tough. So this idea that the photograph held a story and it wasn't necessarily the story about when that photograph was taken. Partly the story was that my family would laugh at that photograph because of my haircut, what I was wearing, the stance, everything about it made me look like I was some kind of macho person. So the family had a story about this, but it wasn't the story that I wanted people to know. So I figured I had to tell a story about that photograph with some other photographs, but maybe that photograph to recapture my own memory, my own past, and my own identity. So uh, we, our workshops, people bring in their family photos and, they, and they, we help them find the stories that they are compelled to tell or moved to tell uh, given that they now have these photographs in front of them, whether it's one or 10 or 20 or a whole photo album. And then they go explore what stories they can tell, given that, like I always say, well, a picture tells a story, but it also tells another story and another story. And right. we see that all the time when we pour over our family albums. Yeah, I think that's interesting. You know, when we started Panga, you know, one of the guiding principles was we always think that of photos or, and when I say a photo, I mean any object or artifact or letter or anything that's in a digitized form that can be, you know, communicated or, or leveraged broadly as this kind of fundamental catalyst for a memory that then leads to a story. And then the inspiration for telling that story typically drives an entire process, right? Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people are challenged because they see they're, they're intimidated by this. You know, they've got all this library of photos and images and everything. And it's kind of like, okay, how do you choose the one that you want to use as your foundation? And how do you get started telling a story? And there's, you know, people get wound up in the idea that they've got to be perfect or they've got to, you know, tell this novella um, rather than just finding something that's important to them within the imagery. Can you talk to that a little bit? Sure. Well, I totally understand this idea, the, the sort of the idea of digital and storytelling, right? Just the, the blending of those two can be feel intimidating. Digital, oh, it must mean technology. Right. It's, it's got a computer. It's got all, you know, I have to use a program. <laughs> and, and I had all those issues myself, right? I saw the value because I saw photographs. I cer certainly was interested in storytelling coming from a, running a small town rural newspaper, you're hearing stories all the time. And I'd have to choose a photograph to put in there and I'd have to put a caption or we'd have to write the story that accompanied the photograph and all of that stuff. Right. But it was still sort of like old tech. And so this idea with Dana Ashley of making videos and putting photographs in sequence and recording your voice to them, adding this other element, which is your own voice to them, was intimidating. And certainly in, Sto in Story Center, in our process, we understand that. It's sort of like, it's not a dumbing down, but it's looking at the common denominator. We recognize that we're not necessarily digital media makers, but we do want to, to tell people that's not the important part. The important part is you all have stories and, and the journey is to become a storyteller. And of course, there's many ways you can become a storyteller. You can write a blog post or you can write a letter to somebody or we write stories all the time in our emails. But this is one way we wanted to get people to connect the visual archive they had and explore what that meant to them and to write a little script. And we can go to, a, to a, some slides here in a minute if we want to go through that process and, and, and tell the story. So we really recognize the intimidation factor of digital media yeah, we want to simplify it without it being just a templated because we know everyone will have their own journey in telling their own stories. So our, the facilitator process is really about meeting where you're at, where you're coming from and, and, and providing the support, which is what I loved about Ponga. I mean, it's about we, we want to do the heavy lifting. You are the one that have all the, the, the stories to tell. You're the ones with the connection to the photographs. And we want to just give you a, a doorway so you can access your own your own creative power and your own sense of being a storyteller. Yeah, you know, it's funny with the, the technology enablement today. And of course, we all observe those of us that have kids or associated with seeing younger people in any way, shape or form, either in the workplace or personally, um, et cetera. You know, we've, we've seen this phenomenal and it's probably maybe only within the last three to five years where 
there's been this gigantic movement of people moving from strictly consumers of content and stories mm. and now becoming creators, right? And that's that's got to help the spread of digital storytelling. The, the challenge in my mind, of course, is that so much of the stuff that we see has no um, structure, really isn't formed around a, a story. It's more having to do with what I might call uh, attention deficit driven engagement that's designed to be in the 30 second or less kind of category. And I think there's a lot of people that want to figure out, okay, how do we use these tools now? Because everybody's got a story, right? So mm -hmm. how do we relieve the pressure on creating a formal framework and create a narrative based on the visuals so that we can kind of just pull back the cur curtain a little bit and maybe have you demystify the process for us a little bit? Sure. So it well, seems a little less craft and a little mm -hmm. bit more authentic and vulnerable so people can find that the whole process is approachable rather than you know what I mean? Unorganized yep. in a TikTok kind of fashion. Well, certainly. And, and, you know, we, the motivation has to come from sort of within rather than, you know, necessarily audience driven, right? People, you know, people at Roots Tech are, are sitting with family histories. The motivation mm -hmm. is not about how to make, you know, the next uh, viral video. I mean, Story Center, that's not our purpose. The purpose right. isn't isn't to make the cat video, right? The TikTok. I mean, and this is the, the interesting thing about the consumer or the ones that do make it for the mass consumption. You know, my kids are no strangers to the world of TikTok and, and things that they can all easily get hooked into. Um, and so I'm, I'm not battling that world, but that's not actually everybody because I'm a boomer. I, you know, my world is not, I'm a, a digital native. I'm a digital immigrant as the term goes. Yeah. And so I think there's the people that are actually still holding on to the family history of photographs are more interested in about how to archive that in different ways. And what do those stories mean? And digital storytelling is a way to capture things beyond the photographs themselves. It's a way of capturing a memory uh, that you can share to whoever you want to share and, and send it almost like sometimes people do send these out as sort of digital letters. They're like homages to a family history. And the, the richness of the work I've done in the last 20 years, I, I've done extremely a lot of work in, in the historical context of communities, uh, whether they're First Nation, Indigenous, Métis, right? Or they're of a certain neighborhood. We've done stories about a transformation of a neighborhood. So it is absolutely rooted in history. All of our experiences happened at some time, even if it was a day ago and in some place. And if there's a, a, a photographic record or a home movie record of it, there's something about putting that together and putting our, our sort of energies into bringing that picture to life beyond just putting them in the photo album. How can they, we open up that photo album and make that photo mouth sound like something hear a voice, hear an experience and, and build on yeah. that, right? And yeah. in our workshops, people go, I have a similar experience. And the part where I liked about Ponga was in a single photograph, you can layer all that meaning making into it. So our workshops, and maybe we should take a look at an example, is about meaning making. When yeah. it comes down to it, a photograph is a photograph and it's wonderful to hold on to them and have a place to store them make sure they don't collect dust and get ruined. But at some point, we want to make meaning of our lives. And to do that, we want to make meaning. We pull those photographs out and all of a sudden those photographs, like my very first photograph of the car I bought, I wanted to make new meaning with that rather than just have it the meaning that others made for it. Yeah. Well, please share some of the, sure. the items that you brought along with today, because I think that would be really valuable. And, and as we're going, I, I know uh, we have Barbara in the chat, so I'm just hoping that people can see these. Uh, and so anyone, like camera, just make sure that these are going. So here we are, I'll just move through my deck. Um, and we've talked about the history. There's Dana, there you go. There's a visual of him on his log with the TV. And there was all sorts of different iterations. That was the Joe's Diner, it was a digital clubhouse. People, it was like a maker space. This is in 1992, 1991, so a long time ago. But we evolved into this notion of, of, of the Center for Digital Storytelling where the workshop model just brought 
normal people, gen, I'm the public workshop director, people sign up for our workshops. In they come, they bring a collection of photographs, and we help them craft a short little film, typically about three minutes long. And we've done this thousands of times. And we, like I say, we rebranded and start to Story Center. We're doing podcast workshops. We do other things, but our bread and butter, the foundation workshop, the digital storytelling workshop, is around bringing people bringing their photo photo albums in, their family photo albums in, and crafting short little stories uh, with that media as their primary inspiration. You know, I think you were really interested, you know, our tagline, or we have a few of them, but, you know, listening is our core technology, right. listen deeply, tell stories. And what does that mean? You know, our process is really about listening. And if you think about, I was thinking about this the other day, because I'm reading about language literacy as my kids are learning to be readers. One is really good and one is not so good. So how do we learn to read? Well, all stories were from a listening, right? We going way back, right? Back when I was wearing, you know, uh, a, a kind of animal skin with a spear, whatever. I was listening to stories. Someone would come back, tell the story of the hunt, and then I would have to listen to a story. So we never first read stories, we listened. So we want to tap back into the listening part. And to do that, we have to hear people ex kind of talk about a photograph. And this is what happened. And this is who's in it. And this is why it's important to me. So I love the Jeanette Winterson quote, um, everything in storytelling begins with language and language be begins with listening. And of course it does. That's how we learn. We learn through listening. But the beautiful thing is we can also enhance that, that engagement through the visual aspect. We're also visual creatures. You know, there's, I think I've heard something like we're gestated in sound, but we're born into vision, right? It, assuming that we have those, those, those capacities. Um, so uh, don't want to be able to describe to me. Yeah. Right. So, you know, but uh, so um, this story, and now let me just, so part of when I met Barbara and then have since met you and I saw the power of Ponga in adding multiple layers of storytelling and meaning into a single photograph. It made me think of this story I made for myself, by myself, as an example to show my workshop participants that one photograph can hold a lot of memory and a lot of story potential. And so I thought, this is kind of like a Ponga story that I made without even knowing Ponga existed. Ponga would have made my, this a little easier, although actually it wasn't that hard for me to do. And I had a lot of fun. And so what I'm going to show you is this story that I made from a photograph I found online. And when I saw this photograph, because I was looking at some of my own history back living in England as a, as a kid, I, this photograph came through, you know, a, a, a public uh, sh uh, photo sharing website. And I went, oh my goodness, it was taken. I could have been in that park that day. Wow. And so that got me going because it's from 1964. It's ex I, that could be me on the bike. Oh, I didn't have quite as fancy a bike as that, as you'll see in the in the in the video. So let me show this. Uh, you'll sort of see how I took this photograph and expanded it and made it multiple, like a multimedia piece. But it's one photograph with a little teaser at the end. Here we go. Recently, I found this picture on the internet. It's a view from Lowndes Park, Chesham, England, taken in 1964. The Beatles were all the rage, and I would have been six. In the summer of 1963, we left Canada for England and moved into 41 Kirtle Road on a dead-end street of row housing. Just over the hill crest is the dairy farm me and the Bleasdale brothers discovered on one of our weekend adventures. And there were many adventures. I can see the roof of the train station the end of the Metropolitan Line from London. 
the train Dad would take into the city each Monday and return Friday afternoon. Then there's Scuttle's Pond, where I learned to skip stones and catch frogs, and the parallel bars, where on a dare I had attempted to hang upside down, only to fall head first, and the bench where an older man, after witnessing the fall and my bloody scalp, yelled out, Better get him to a hospital before he bleeds to death. Then there's the path by the bench, heading off to the right that crosses Bury Lane on its way to St. Mary's Church. The church where my sister Jane, while running during the Community May Day celebration, cut her neck on a wire holding up a helium-filled balloon. The same Bury Lane, when one late afternoon, leaving Lowndes Park, two older boys, scruffy and menacing, wearing knee socks, gray shorts, and cardigans, passed by me and snarled, Hey, Yankee, go home. What a fantastic memory. Well, it, and of course, a, caval, a, a cascade of memories, right? Yeah. And I think that was the, the, the thing for me, which is like when I see Ponga and how you can add little other, the, the meaning is a kind of, con, of a concert. So a photograph captures a moment in time, but there's something happened just before, something happened after. It's a place to 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 bring a lot of energy and, and sort of memory into a photograph, not just this is Lowndes, Lowndes, uh, Lowndes Park in 1964 in a place called Chesham, England. And if you want to get all the Wikipedia information of Chesham, where it is and the map and all that, um, that wasn't my purpose of this story. It was about for me to explore the things that immediately came to my mind. Yeah. Right down to that car, because we don't hear standard cars very much anymore. Right. But that's all there was. And I, 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 it brings back a memory. Anytime I hear somebody shifting from first to second gear, I think about times when traveling with my grandfather, delivering groceries in his Austin minor, and he was shifting gears. That's a very uh, clear memory. So that's all right. of that comes into play when I look at one photograph. That's fantastic. You know, it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about the layering of this. And you mentioned earlier in your workshops that people bring their albums in and you workshop around telling a story around uh, one of these photos. You picked a photo here that was unbelievably rich in memories. I, mm -hmm. I don't know how many were there. I didn't count them, but there was probably at least six and maybe eight different distinct elements that were a part of this. When you're helping clients or your workshop attendees go through this process, how do you help them choose the one photograph as the point of departure so this becomes an easy thing for them to get engaged with? Just moving these things. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's true. People come to, first of all, experience this process. Going back to the, this idea of consumption, we've consumed, we've consumed. Part of our mission is to get people into the making. You're right. the ones with the experiences. You're the ones with the, with the collection of photographs. You're the ones with the stories to tell. And we were getting a little tired of people telling stories of other people, right? And there's a place for that, right? The journalists go and tell stories about the community that in yeah. East Palestine that's under duress around, you know. But then they, there's stories that everybody will have in their own experience of that somewhere down the road. And we wanted to make sure that people could um, access their own voice their own stories and to do that we have to get people into a, a place where they're feeling comfortable with those photographs where they that they, they're meaningful and we recognize the importance of the photographs and more importantly the stories and the experiences that those photographs house and so part of our workshop is to get people to reflect and we do that through just sharing photographs or an idea for a story so some people will bring a photo album into the workshop and open it up and say, I'm, I'm doing a story about my grandmother, right, who passed away or is about to celebrate her 90th birthday or whatever. There's a, there's a kind of reason and meaning they're doing it for. And they'll have the photograph album 
And, and so we want them to just explore that and talk it out through the other storytellers in the group. And it's really interesting when you just voice something about an idea for a story and you maybe share a photograph or two in the group, you're already on your path to becoming a storyteller. It, well, you already were, but it's sort of like making you recognize that because right. people want, ooh, can I, what other photographs? Or tell me more. <laughs> or I, my grandmother's about to turn 92, right? We're already sort of in the sharing mode, which is what storytelling is about, is about sharing and communicating across uh, each each our lives and finding that sort of bridge between our, our, our experiences, whether they're mutual experiences or different. Then we get people to sort of write and not like write an essay, but sometimes it's a letter. If, the, if it is a story that you're trying to tell to your grandmother and she's no longer there, but this idea of a letter is incredibly rich with storytelling and with intimacy. So we want people to be authentic and tell their own truth and their own what reasons for telling it. And usually a letter or something like that can be a good prompt, but we get people to sort of get their ideas out of their head somewhere down where they can reflect on them and so you know sometimes we'll give them a writing prompt right based on what they've shared in the story circle the reflection part and we do it in a kind of story circle way and then we get people to just write and then we help them craft something that that'll feel natural for them to speak and then they record that and now they have the story and, and they've been inspired by the photograph and maybe there's a few others but let's just stay with my once in the Chiltern Hills photograph. That one had about eight different frames of the photograph. It's the same photograph. I just zoomed in on different aspects and moved us yeah. around the photograph, which is the beauty of digital media video making is you can create animation. You can take us into a photograph and to the left and to the right as you express some experience that that photograph uh, is being, you, it pulls out of you. And so the production part is very, very facilitated, very supportive. We give you a way, just like if you went to Ponga and you said, I don't know how to use Ponga. And there's all these great videos on how to. So we do a, a how to do very simple video editing, add your voice. And once you see your voice next to the photographs that in the photograph that's meaningful to you, it's transformative. Yeah. You now become a digital storyteller. You yeah, I was going to say, I, I would it's imagine. Combination. Right. It's almost a cathartic experience for people coming in and being able to say, I want to be able to tell these stories. I have this rich content in the form of this album of images, and I, I want to be good at this, but I, you know, there, there's a nervousness about it. And it seems like as you help them go through this, all of a sudden they realize at the end of the workshop, you know what? I am a storyteller. I can do this and I can use these best practices. Um, we got a question Rob, uh, mm -hmm. from somebody from the audience that um, who's been actually to three Story Center workshops, Lynn Walters, and uh -huh. she said she said she was told that the story comes first, and then the visuals, uh, parenthetically photographs, are used to illustrate the story. Is is this right? Well, in the process, and hi, hi Lynn, uh, that is a typical process. Um, in every facility, we do have a methodology. We want people to sort of think about the story because we want them to get the voice. And so in the process of the production, typically it is the piece of writing that you voice. But it, in a lot of cases, it's inspired. You can't, you're not writing something against a, the, the lack of a photograph. Now, some workshops, they're not about the photograph in our custom work. But what we want people to do is bring their memories and right. if their memories and their experiences are, are somewhat held in the photograph collection they have, we encourage them to use those materials. Sometimes they tell the story and they, and they don't use that photograph, but the photograph was a, was a launching point often. But she's right, and, and Lynn's right, in the sense that we record the voice. And that's the first layer of a digital story in the production, because now you hear it and say, okay, when I say this, like in Once in the Chilton Hills, when I say this, and I moved that order around. I just said little memories, but then I played with the chronological order. I didn't say first this and then this, but by moving it around a photograph, it gave it a, a, a sort of visual flow and a kind of narrative flow because I was getting to the, the part of the end, which I knew I wanted to get to. And we'll get to that in a minute. But once I have the voice recording, I can then position the parts of that photograph that I want you to see first, the boy on the bike, 
the car moving up to the hills, across the hills, all of those become in concert with what I'm saying. I'm moving you around the photograph with my voice. So it really is the combination, but right, a lot of times, once, even if they have a photograph that is the inspiration, getting the, that we know, getting the voice recorded and down to then add that picture back on top of is the transformative part where you're going, oh, so when I say this, you're seeing that. And that's where you, the digital storyteller becomes sort of recognized in the person, like, oh, right? That's well, I think a lot of people are motivated by imagery. You know, we when we started Ponga, we did lots of market research and discovered that there's, you know, trillions of undigitized photos around there that people want to preserve and curate. Um, they want to get in, into a form where they're not lost. Um, and as they do that, we've discovered from speaking with a lot of our clients that and members that you know, the photographs wind up, sometimes they're stuck for ways of thinking about these memories and these stories they want to tell. But the minute you put a, a an image in front of them, the inspiration that comes from that is mm -hmm. extraordinary. And it, sometimes it leads to greater stories within the fabric of a single image, like the one you told of the Chilton mm -hmm. Hills, or it winds up connecting images together. And right. you know, somebody may have a library of a couple of thousand photos, and there may be only a couple of hundred in there that are really material and relevant that you could actually develop a relationship with. Mm -hmm. But you kind of start to string them together, and all of a sudden now you have a very rich kind of set of anecdotes about your family. Well, that's right, because the, the story, is, we always say that, that there's, this, there's the story of the photograph. It's you know, who, what, where, when, why. Yeah. And then it's like, or... The time, it's also the time when, you know, <laughs> my sister stepped on the sea urchin, you know, everybody's looking smiley in the photograph, but then right after that photograph, you know, tragedy happened, you know, an urchin went up and the spine went in the foot and the foot got infected. And all of a sudden your family is now remembering the trials and tribulations of that camping trip, not just the photograph with everybody smiling. And that's where the sharing comes in, the richness of the story beyond the photograph. And if there was a second photograph about, you know, somewhere else down the road or at the hospital with the foot bandaged up, you're now putting together a kind of digital story narrative with the yeah. visuals. One saying, ooh, and remember this photograph? And it starts, you start to interact with that photo album, with that archive differently than just a catalog. They become uh, mnemonics. They become um, the, the, the foundation for the storytelling. And that's when photo albums, be, you know, whether they're, if you can get people in the room these days, and, and around a photograph, but uh, an album, but if you can create a little video and share it, um, and, and all of a sudden people are like responding to it. They're like, the family's first of all, appreciative that you took the time to create a little story and a memory for them, um, which again is so why the, the, the link to Pongo for me was so immediately like light bulb. It's like, yeah. yeah, what was what was your aha moment as it relates to Ponga? It was the pho a photograph. I think it's on the website of a, a family gathering, and and which we typically get right. A lot of photos, people are like, it's a family gathering. There's something about you know family gatherings and all the people there. Dana Ashley's first home movie, he calls it home movie. His very first digital story was around the three brothers coming out of the cottage. And they would pirouette because the dad would say, okay, turn. It was a little thing they did. And they kept doing this as a kind of annual thing to get, you know, the family reunion, whatever. But in that photograph, it was, you know, was what they were wearing. And there was the cameo. Someone was wearing, it was an aunt or a grandmother or a mother. And then as, she, as Barbara was navigating, you click on that cameo and you get a little thing. And it tells you the story of the cameo. Right. Which was like, aha. Uh -huh beautiful right and instead of saying and my mother was wearing a cameo in a digital story that cameo was an heirloom from many many generations and now the story that picture becomes the story of the cameo but in ponga you can engage in the, the the learning and the story and the imagination of how important that cameo was and then ostensibly go to something else in the photograph and like who's that person and like they don't look very happy and maybe someone would have you click on that and you get a little pop saying, yeah, that was Uncle Ralph and, you know, his wife had just left him. And I'm, you know, there's a, I don't want to make it all sad stories, but there'd be something that made him grumpy, right? He had a flat tire on his way and got there late or something like that. And all of a sudden that photograph is like peppered with 
layers of stories and therefore a larger meaning and importance to the family archive. Yeah, and that one of the, huge. yeah, that's great to hear you say that. And one of the things as a, as a lever to that as well, that um, we wanted to also make it easy to add multimedia components as, uh, you know, whether or not it could be, you know, maps of where locations were yeah. in the thirties and what they look like today. It might be, you know, a piano recital of a grandmother who was a prodigy as a kid. It could mm -hmm. have been, you know, something that might be a Wikipedia or a historical element from YouTube about something that happened in the Civil War or something like that. We have lots of, of members that are doing things around, uh, you know, their wartime veteran family members and adding historical elements as embedded multimedia. And that just adds additional layers. And one of the things we try to do is get the technology out of the way mm -hmm. so that the member can spend their time telling the story and curating the information and sharing it with others, rather than worrying about how to coordinate three or four different technology elements to make all this thing work together, which are not only clumsy, but nine tenths out of 10, they don't work. Uh, yeah, there's, there's an accessibility factor. I mean, Story Centers is oriented, right? We know that production, we don't typically record our voice right in, in a story way. We might write a report or Maybe and we don't write letters anymore. We write emails, and they're usually um, poor examples of storytelling sometimes. But but what we want to do is sort of demystify that. We want people to be creative. We want their right. their energies to be inspired, right? And and think if people are inspired, they will they will add those layers in Ponga or make a digital story and put two or three photos together and record their voice. You know, we're recording this. It's actually not as hard as we think it is. In fact, it has become accessible. We just want to, people to be exposed to that accessibility. And, and, and part of that's why the facilitative part of it, of what story, what, what makes us successful is we guide people. We don't tell them what story to tell. We don't tell them what picture to use. We provide a sort of scaffolding and a kind of a hand, like leading them through and where they it might be a little difficult. We say, well, let's slow down here and let's let's learn that and let's figure that out. And then they get through that little muddy puddle and then they move on. And, and you know, the same thing with Ponga is, you know, there's, we call it like, it's a bit of a hockey stick. You, you get a little bit and then all of a sudden you're off to the races. It's kind yeah. of, you know, you just have to sort of, and the more you can facilitate the start and get people feeling comfortable and seeing, and then they see the fruits of that labor, like, it's always important that everyone in our workshop makes a story. And it's, at the end, we screen it with everybody in the workshop. And all of a sudden, you can just feel like the energy of the positive that I created that. I actually have a creative bone in my body. And that's yeah, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's nice to hear you say that. We think of, I mean, you put great words about the facilitative nature of this, that, you know, we're trying to take the heavy lifting away and and encourage and enable and support the ability for people to be creative and do things that are more joyful around the storytelling part, get the tech piece out of the way so that people can enjoy the process and, right. and make it easy. You know, you hit on something a little bit earlier that I wanted to, to, to poke at for a couple of minutes before we close um, about how photos and stories can potentially connect generations, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, with this the ability to digitally share these things, um, we now have the way, I mean, you can imagine what it would be like that there's probably nothing more powerful than for a young person to hear a, a historical anecdote or a memory from a departed loved one that was recorded before they passed that might have been a memory that might have gone back to World War II or something like mm -hmm. that that was very colorful. That's a very powerful activity as, as well as just creating conversations. I have a a personal example that I sometimes spot, talk about, about my 18 year old son interacting with my 90 year old mother. Um, they normally don't have a reason to talk to one another, except for the normal grandson, grandmother relationship. But over a photograph from World War II from about 1940, um, they had a 45 minute conversation that never would have taken place otherwise. And that was powerful for me to observe. And I thought it was really interesting. And you know, the, the workshops that you're developing can kind of create that library of memories that people can tap into for long-term use later on as we pass our family histories down from generation to generation. 
totally correct. I mean, there's a couple of things that that uh, sort of bubble up for me is is um, of course this idea of archiving, and I mean, I'm just like many many people at this Roots Tech um, experience that I have boxes of photographs of my own journey. I don't have a lot of my family old family stuff. You know, it's another sister has that, but right, it just sits in a box, right, and. I can't make stories of everything. And it's kind of nice to know. I don't like throwing things away. Uh, although, yeah. you know, there's only so many pictures through a windshield of another mountain or something, another road trip. Right. But when I do make stories, it, it revalue, it puts a different value on it. So the kind of the idea that the archive is a living, breathing archive, that the stories and just even a little, you know, a few stories to the large archive, just so as, you know, there's six stories here. Let's say make, you make six digital stories or I make six. Right. It's just reflective of all the other stories. And just that little connection to one or two stories just gives, you know, we can't tell all the stories, but we can tell some. And, and that just shows that we, at least we recognize the power. In the intergenerational, it really has been some of my most um, rewarding work is when I've been in situations and it's happened with, you know, a, a, a son and a grandfather and a daughter and a grandfather have been in a workshop a public workshop it's rare but i have done work in in community settings where uh the the youth the the, the younger generation was kind of the support and the one probably going to be doing the production right but they had to honor the the grandfather or the elder in the community and they were looking at these old photographs and part of their responsibility is all storytellers responsibility is to be honorable to the subject they're talking about to do it from their most authentic truthful right heartfelt place and not fabricate and and watching youth working with seniors uh is probably the most rewarding because it it uh it, it is about even though we're making these stories individually about our own voice and all that they really are about making community and so your your experience with your son and his grandfather uh, warms my heart because that's been some of the most profound work for me in this is watching intergenerational storytelling yeah. happen. Yeah, thanks. Well, Rob, this has been an amazing session today and, and a lot of high value content. Um, you know, we enjoyed sharing Ponga with, with the audience and want to thank Rob Kershaw for lending his expertise and experience today. Um, you can learn more about um, his uh, organization at storycenter.org please make a point to check out his website and look at the type of workshops and uh, educational materials and programs that they offer. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to hear more about special programs from Ponga and Story Center, please pop your email into the box in the lower left of our website landing page, and we'll make sure you hear about future sessions from www.ponga.com. And then Barbara, really quickly, could you give the uh, attendees a little bit of an overview of some of the special offers? Sure. Uh, great, guys. That was really a uh, fascinating uh, conversation, and I know uh, I'll certainly be watching it again myself. Um, yeah, I, it's such a thrill to uh, be here as part of this uh, Roots Tech event. And so as part of that, we have a celebration kind of landing page uh, at uh, ponga.com. I have shared this in the uh, chat here, ponga.com slash roots tech, where we have not only uh, a series of special events of which this is our keynote, uh, two more follow tomorrow focused on how I ponga with genealogist uh, and uh, genealogy researcher Lisa Listen. Uh, talking about how I Ponga. So she's doing a very 15 minutes of specifically how she uses Ponga as part of her research, treating the, as you say, honoring the, the photographs, family photographs as um, artifacts for genealogical research and then using Ponga to, to pull things out. So often things that are invisible in those photographs to find the deeper stories. And she focuses a great deal on uh, social history uh, to better understand uh, her, your, your ancestors, not just what the facts are of their, of their lives. Um, then later uh, tomorrow afternoon, we have a, uh, an annual program for us called a porch swing, a Ponga porch swing where we talk to our members and their guests and people who are just interested in Ponga, a little bit about what they are themselves doing, a little bit of our own uh, storytelling around a campfire. 
and then tomorrow, uh, the following day on Friday, um, we will also have a special guest we haven't even announced yet, um, actually later in that same day, Friday, uh, with uh, uh, Victoria McGregor, who will do her own How I Ponga, uh, using uh, Ponga and uh, printed, beautifully illustrated family trees, and talking about building those stories back into a standard tree illustration and the richness that can come from that. So we're very excited about those events. And it wouldn't be a convention conference without a special deal. So sure enough, our Ponga, which is uh, we market at $9 a month or $108 a year. We have a special annual membership at $99. Uh, but during our show, we have a very special price of $65 for a year. And for our annual members, we also include what we call our family masterclass. Um, all memberships allow you to um, any member to invite as many free guests as they like. And our annual membership with the masterclass gives us a way to sit down with your whole family if you'd like. It's up to you as to how many people you'd like to have to invite them all in to show to get started. So you're all on the same page about how you're going about all of this. And th those are quite frankly, always fun to do because you hear a lot about what someone's trying to do and we get to put a little best practice spin into how we can help uh, make that happen. And that's how we're doing all of this in terms of building community of storytellers and why we're so thrilled to meet and and, and go forward to get uh, today with uh, with Story Center. Um, and uh, then the final thing, of course, in our booth is the live booth. So it's we're doing our best in the virtual environment to make it a, a trade show, a, a conference. So if you go to ponga.com slash Roots Tech, and again, it's right there at the top of this uh, of this screen. Uh, we have a live booth, so you just click the link right there, and you'll go straight into the booth. And we're over here, not over there at the moment, but we will be uh, as soon as this uh, this session ends. And uh, all of this will be recorded or has been recorded, and we'll be getting out an email uh, to all of you who have registered um, just at the conclusion of this with the the link to be able to view that. And of course, back to all of our deals and offers. Well, that gives you the high, pay, high point. Thanks a lot, Cameron, and so much, Rob. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming along today and appreciate your attention and participation. We've got more to share with you, so look forward to future communications about content, events, programs, partnerships, and demos. And we look forward to welcoming you as members. So please check out our website and subscribe today, and we'll see you on a future event. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. See you in the booth. <laughs> you bet. <laughs>